Hello and welcome to the PC Security Channel. Today we'll finally be talking about the new testing method, why I adopted it, and how it works. And also, the malloc pseudocode for those of you who really want an insight into my Python script that does all of this automated testing. Before proceeding though, I should say that the test method may be updated in the future, and I may not make videos for every small new change, so you should always visit the website, that is the pcsecuritychannel.com slash test method, to get the most up-to-date information. With that out of the way, let's get started. So first of all, I'm doing all of these new tests in two phases. Phase 1 is a baseline test, and the purpose of it is essentially to eliminate a lot of poor performing products, so we don't have to spend a lot of time just to find out that something failed at something very basic. And given the time constraint the new testing method takes, this is actually a very useful tool. We're mostly going to be having malware and ransomware in phase one with a few PUPs, but keep in mind I don't have absolute control about the malware that's used, but the number will be very low and it'll be a very quick test. Due to this fact, if a product fails phase one, the testing stops, that's the end of the test for that product, a pass is required in phase one to go to phase two. What's a pass you might ask, and we will talk about that in some of the later criteria. Phase two is a more in-depth test with a much larger number of samples, potentially a lot more false positives and grayware and PUPs. It's expected to take a longer time period and typically will have twice, thrice, or more number of malware samples than phase one. Keep in mind though, this does not intrinsically mean that the phase two detection ratio should always be lower than phase one, because if the files are fewer, even a few broken files can largely affect the detection ratio. So keep in mind these are just guidelines to structure the test and not hard rules. Now that we know how the test is going to be conducted in two phases, let's discuss the types of results that a product might have. The first and most important important thing is the clean sheet record. And when I refer to this, I'm referring to this at the end of phase two. So we're not talking about how the product did after phase one, we're talking about how the product did at the end of the test. And by the way, under test results in the website, you are going to see a record of how every product performed in these terms. So if you understand how to read them, you will be able to get all this information at a glance. So a yes in a clean sheet record means that no infections were found on the test system and there was no permanent damage. Again, it's not a hard rule, so maybe if there's one PUP I might still grant the product a clean sheet, but in general the idea is the system should be clean and not compromised in any major way. A partial in a clean sheet essentially means that it's one of those cases where there might be malware on the system, but the malware may have partially failed, or I'm unsure and I cannot verify if the system was successfully protected because there are way too many malware traces. So partial in a clean sheet essentially means the system isn't verifiably destroyed by malware, but neither is it verifiably clean. If you watch my last Komodo video, you'll understand how the partial category is going to work. The third type of result when it comes to clean sheets is no which means the test system was infected, there is persistent malware after reboot, there's something that shows up, maybe there's something active on the system. In that case, the product does not get a clean sheet. All of these three results refer to the state of the system at the end of the full test, which includes both phase one and phase two. However, if a product does not get to phase two because it's disqualified at phase one, it gets a fail. Now moving on to the percentage metrics, uh, the proactive detection and the malware removal rate. The proactive detection, as the name suggests, tells you what percentage of malware was blocked by the AV product proactively. And that means it was blocked before it could get into the system and start doing things. Blocked on execution, essentially. For products that use sandbox or behavior monitoring and the file is caught after a period of execution and then maybe its actions are rolled back, that it does not count as proactive detection. Which is why, again, I always focus on the clean sheet metric the most. Because that reflects everything. The malware removal rate is an even less useful metric, but I include it anyway just to give you an idea of how the AV engine works. All this does is tell you how many files from the folder were removed by the AV product, which sometimes can be a sign of how good the product's removal capabilities are, how well engineered it is, or sometimes it doesn't tell you much at all. So I implore you to not take this particular metric too seriously. 
While judging the results, I would always focus the most on the clean sheet record, then on the proactive detection, and only use the malware removal rate as a sideline guidance, just to give me an idea of how the AV engine works. Now moving on, we have the actual Malik script, and today I'm going to tell you how it works, but there are a few things you should note since people have already mentioned these things. The Malik script is not malware. Okay, it's not malicious at all. All it does is run files that have a certain type of name. And some people kind of argue that shouldn't it be considered malicious because it runs malware? I mean, no, that's not how programs work, because if it did, then Internet Explorer and File Explorer would be malware. Now I'll actually discuss the pseudocode for this Python script, which I have in a document here. Now, I know a lot of you are probably already typing in the comments, where can I download the code? Can you just give me the code so I can copy paste it and do my tests? Why don't you just put it on GitHub or open source it? Here's the thing. This is an incredibly simple code to write and anyone with basic programming knowledge should be able to use the explanation I give in the pseudocode and translate that into any language of their choice. So you can do it in Python, you can do it in C Sharp, you can do it in any other scripting language of your choice. It shouldn't take that long and it's really not that difficult. So if you're asking me to share this code, it kind of suggests that you probably don't know what you're doing very well, so maybe you shouldn't be having access to this. Also, the last thing I want is for kids to use this code to infect a ton of systems. I've seen this a lot in the past. People just take samples I share and they just run around going through stores infecting systems because they think it's funny. And that's the last kind of activity I want to encourage on the PC Security Channel. So you do realize that just putting this source code out there on the internet just makes it easy for people who have no idea what they're doing or people who just want to cause trouble and mischief. It's like giving a gun to a kid. There's nothing good that's ever going to come of that. And if you're a legitimate student or somebody who really wants to do their own test, this should be something very easy for you to learn. If you don't have the patience to learn something this basic, you're only going to cause trouble by getting access to something you probably shouldn't have. Now I know some of the wannabe know-it-all trolls are going to dislike at this point, but that's okay. Let's actually move on to business. So the way the script works, it's essentially based on the name of the file. So it's based on the malware name, and that gives me an advantage that I can actually switch out phase one and phase two and still use the same script with no alteration. First, it finds every file with the name malware, and then we essentially have a try block where it tries to run the malware sample as a new process group. This is important because I don't want the malware to run as a sub process. Also, I don't want the test to stop and wait for the malware to finish execution because that would be problematic and might also cause the AV to flag the script, which is why I run every single file as a new process group and I do a break away from the current job. So it gets executed on its own time, but the test continues. I have a short delay of about 0.2 seconds. This is to simulate a more realistic case so that I'm not overloading the AV or the system. Then essentially we have an if loop um, that checks whether or not the task was completed successfully and if it was then it's counted as a miss. If the file fails to execute it either means that the file's broken, it doesn't work on Windows, or it was blocked proactively and in that case it is considered as a block. So yes, if a file fails execution it is counted as a block and not a miss. So a product's proactive detection cannot be damaged by the fact that there are a lot of broken files in the folder that don't execute. Then we end the for loop and then we do some calculations. Of course there are a lot of calculations in each step. We calculate the proactive detection, but I mean that's boring stuff. You don't want to know that. Then at the end we check the number of files that are there in the folder and based on the number of files that were there in the folder before, which is calculated when I run the script first, which is why I run it, and then I type yes once I make sure real-time protection is turned on. So the reason I have the real-time protection turned off is because if it's turned on then it'll start deleting files before the script can get an accurate reading of the number of files in the folder. So first I run the script, take the number, and then I turn on the real-time protection, and then actually start executing the malware. And based on that, we calculate the malware removal rate using the count at the end of the test, and then we just print the results. Pretty simple. It's not really that complicated. 
but it works wonderfully well and as you've seen in the last few tests it's fun now some of you don't enjoy this new testing method as much and you've mentioned it don't worry about that i will be doing some slightly different tests but i feel a real-time test is a better indicator of how well a product functions it's fun to watch and at the same time gets rid of all that boring stuff which is now automated so i don't have to right click and scan double click every time which is kind of pointless if you think about it you might say why do you not do the website prevention test and the reason for that is that kind of testing isn't very good because a lot of the sites that i use to get the websites and i can only test like five or ten manually and website detection is just basically blacklisting so if the the av product i'm testing uses the same blacklist i'm using for the test then yeah it's going to block everything if it doesn't it'll block few maybe none and there's really not that much technology to assess not to mention all the malware author has to do to get around that kind of blacklisting is just re-upload the same malware on a different site and boom that part of the product just goes out of equation so I'm really quite convinced that this is a much better testing method. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and do please check out the test method page on the pcsecuritychannel.com for the most up-to-date information, especially if you're watching this video more than a couple of months after its release. This is Leo from the PC Security Channel. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for all your support. And as always, stay informed, stay secure.